So it's finally here, Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender. Have they cooked? Netflix is coming in strong, taking a page right out of the Disney playbook by repackaging a perfectly great story with an already beautiful portrayal and turning it into a cash grab designed to pander to gullible fans. They wouldn't. I feel you, brother. I wish they didn't. It didn't go too well last time we tried this. And I'm the oh. But the cast and crew are ethnically correct this time, so it'll be good, right? Wrong! Wait, what? Wow, I guess all the fan-pleasing worked. Good job, guys. Unsurprisingly, there's been a parade of YouTubers and critics Netflix paid to say positive things about the show before its release, and they carried out an admirable campaign to convince the fans that this is the adaptation we've all been wanting. And they- FAILED! Well, while that would be funnier, they actually had most people convinced for a while. And then, as it turned out, they changed their minds. Oh, it went up. Maybe that's where all that budget went. Man, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I- actually kind of agree with the critics on this one. For the most part. Gosh, at least the 2010 movie had everyone collectively agree on something. I was honestly kind of taken back by all the ravenous support for this new adaptation before its release. All these people eagerly defending it before even seeing it. Jumping to support it before it even comes out is really not that different from hating on it before it comes out. Just an overly positive mindset versus an overly negative one. Netflix cooked! <laughs> Although, with how this went last time, I find erring on the side of skepticism to be the more rational approach. Don't be Ugh. Now, you might be saying to yourself, but it's an adaptation, a new way of telling the story. Of course they're going to take some creative liberties while bringing it into a new medium. You can't expect it to be exactly the same. And you're right. M. Night Shyamalan's movie was an adaptation, a new way of telling the story, and naturally, he had to take some creative liberties while bringing it into a new medium. It would be foolish to expect it to be the same. Both projects are adapting the same thing. That one deserved criticism, therefore this one does too. So, were they actually able to surpass the movie that shall not be named and meet the impossible expectations? No. Whoa, whoa, hold on, Paku. Let's not judge a book by its corporate overlord just yet. Brutally burning people alive for cheap shock value aside, <laughs> let's begin. Oh no. So we are starting with Sozin's Comet. Look at this, you can barely even see it! Compared to... That comet lit up the whole sky! So... So beautiful. Yes, it is crucial to introduce the comet into the viewer's head as a threat, but waiting to show it was so we could let the characters catch their breath first, and have them share more screen time and build relationships. Now we're coming in hot with it. BAM! The first thing you see! But how will the impeccable writing team use the comet in this new way? Oh, don't worry. We'll get to that shortly. Brace yourself, but this is actually a kind of a cool chase sequence. We immediately know this guy is some kind of spy with important information, so we've established stakes, albeit tropey and undercooked stakes, but the Fire Lord fixes that soon. Your battle plans are already on their way to the Earth Kingdom. Good. Sozin explaining his grand plan is pretty cool, but... A quantum supercomputer calculating for a thousand years could not even approach the number of fucks I do not give. Why didn't we show the Air Nomads gathering at the Southern Air Temple first to establish them as a peaceful and loving society? Then it would have made Sozin revealing his plan to wipe them out hit a lot harder. Or better yet, just skip all the exposition and have him go start cooking. <laughs> Just exposition, after exposition, after exposition. Show don't tell? It's time to let old things die. You're just too stupid to get it on your own, so we have to tell you. 
everything. Fuck that. We can't trust the audience to figure anything out. Real high quality stuff we're starting out with, guys. This just looks like a video game cutscene from the late 2000s. <laughs> Alright, fine. The Southern Air Temple looks pretty cool, I gotta admit. But there's a whole lot less snow, and you'll see why that's a problem here in a second. No, I can't help it. Gordon Cormier's love for his role as Aang is just so contagious. Look at him, he's so happy! This whole sequence is actually really cute, but it's too bad you have to turn your brain off to enjoy it. Because he's just flying. He's just straight up flying without his glider. Gyatso is characterized pretty well in these first few scenes. Aang. And his relationship with Aang is probably one of the better parts of the episode. There may come a day when you wish you'd spent more time with your teachers. That's a death flag, and that's extremely convenient. Imagine if they decided to gather at any of the other temples for the Comet Festival. Guess Sozin's pretty lucky he chose the southern one to invade first, or that would have been... Oh, I guess nobody is home. We'll have to try again in 100 years. Is the Air Nomads all gathering at the Southern One common knowledge? Was Sozin privy to this information? Ugh, oh, I'm starting to put more thought into this than the writers did. <laughs> Gyatso then convenes with the other monks about telling Aang he's the Avatar. Also, their arrows are too dark. The arrows in the original show were much lighter blue. Can't I just keep pretending I'm your friend? Can I just keep pretending I'm your son? You are my friend. You are my son. You will always be my son. Make of that what you will. Did they walk here? From the Fire Nation? Oh, so that's how they got to the Air Temples without flying bison, right, Appa? They used bullshit. Of course! Looks like sustained flight with firebending isn't a super rare move, only seen twice in the show by Ozai and Zhang Zhang, making it seem very special. But Azula flew with firebending too, and she didn't even need the comet. Yo. Now who's nitpicking? Azula is never shown using sustained flight once in the entire show. If anything, she boosts herself once or twice, but nowhere near what we see Ozai doing. Alright, the Air Nomad Genocide. This is definitely gonna ruffle some hairless heads. Uh, oh, come on. For Comet Powered Firebending, it looks the same as the rest of the firebending in the show. And that's, well, lame. It doesn't have the same kick that. Fire Lord Sozin then tortures the living shit out of a woman, atomizing her. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick. Jesus Christ. Hey, I thought we were toning down the sexism. So Sokka's saying, Girls are better at fixing pants than guys, and guys are better at hunting and fighting and stuff like that. It's just the natural order of things. It's too dicey, but making a point to show Sozin brutally turning a female air nomad into ash is fine. Hmm. Okay, Albert. Tell us what you have planned for our new live-action TV PG Avatar show. So it's like the same thing again, but... This time we show the Fire Nation burning bald people. That's absolutely brilliant, Albert. Take our money. Let's see what else Albert Kim has done. Hmm. Oh. Well, that was his first one, so we'll give him a pass. Well, I've heard of Nikita, but it looks kind of boring, so I never watched it. Here's a question for you. Did nobody think to hire the head writer of the show we're adapting? The man who understands the show better than anyone else, Aaron Ehas. Was it because he wasn't, uh, ethnically homogenous? Seriously though, Ko the Face Stealer wouldn't exist without this man. Aaron created this really creepy character, Ko. Welcome. Iroh wouldn't exist without this man. Ah, uh, that's true. But you are clearly outmatched. He's just such a talented writer, and he so clearly understands character and story building. It's just amazing to hear him talk about it. This, what's happening right here is something that I love about Avatar, which is that this necklace that we've known about for so long, and that sort of had its own kind of mini plot where it got lost, and Zuko had it, now we're finding out kind of this deeper history behind it. Like, there are so many things in this show that 
and uh, start off seemingly so innocently and pay off with such depth. It really was lightning in a bottle, wasn't it? Anyway, back to today's special, Cue Ball Fireflakes! Aw, oh, Sozin, so polite of you to knock first. Sozin versus Gyatso. The fight we've all been anticipating. This is gonna be sick! We're gonna see some crazy advanced moves from two of the best benders in the whole world. Aw, oh, sh**. It's just more my lasers bigger than your laser. Ooh, Katara struggling to waterbend when we first see her. I like this. It shows that she doesn't have a master and implies that she's probably been trying this for a long time. Wait a minute, did you just come from the ship that you were absolutely forbidden from going in and definitely respected the rule of not going in there because the ship could be booby trapped? Hmm, well that kind of takes away from the great moment we have later of Aang convincing her. Hey, Bender, you have to let go of fear. Well, maybe we'll get a different and remixed version of that moment where our main characters get to bond, doing a fun activity together. Okay, Sokka's actor is easily one of the best parts of this whole episode. Him and Katara's chemistry is... okay, at least at first. The dynamic between them is cute and decently accurate to the cartoon, but it'll all go away shortly in favor of forced dialogue and exposition. Wow. You were waterbending again, weren't you? Don't worry, no one could see me. Not that it matters. Of course it matters if anyone from the Fire Nation finds our- Wait, well, why would you say that? Are you implying that you think there could be a Fire Nation spy in your village that could see Katara waterbending? You need to vet your people, brother! No one from the Fire Nation has approached the village in years. Thank you! Besides, there's nothing to see. An otter penguin could bend more water than I could. Then they get swept away by the current and crash. Their boat's fine, though. The argument between them here in the cartoon did so many things for both Katara and Sokka's characters. For starters, it established the fact that Katara does actually a lot for him and has a feisty side to her. I even wash all the clothes! Let me tell you! Not pleasant! Katara! And it established Sokka's sexism. Leave it to a girl to screw things up. But I guess modern adults are just too soft for a little traditionalism. Oh no, what a nightmare! Makes me worry for how they'll inevitably butcher Paku. The water around, but you're not feeling the push and pull. <sighs> Maybe that move is too advanced for you. You're too good for this world. <laughs> I'm not advocating for sexism, I'm advocating for a character overcoming flaws, which is a staple of good writing, but... Maybe that move is too advanced for you. Plus, OG Katara shows more emotion in this one scene than the new Katara shows in the entire episode. An otter penguin could bend more water than I could. Wait, so you're telling me I... So you're telling me... <laughs> I can have... A portable avatar state notification. That's fing hilarious. Treat me like white. Finally. This, this is good. Dallas makes a convincing Zuko here. His delivery of finally is pretty spot on, albeit a bit less determined and foreboding. Finally. But as far as the one-to-one -one recreations of the scenes they do go, this one's by far the best, and the shortest. Wh- Wait, so you're just gonna leave Appa? You didn't see the- Flying ball of fur. Well, it can't get any stupider than this. Let me take a look. It can't be. This is an airbender. Oh, the marking on his hand gave it away, not the one on his face! Yeah. That's not strange at all. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Humans can't fly! Check again! <sighs> well, if you didn't believe me before, believe your own eyes! Remember when it was explicitly shown that airbenders couldn't fly without their gliders while bending the air currents around them? You know, like, restrictions to not make any one bending style so overpowered? Well, f that! Well, well, Zaheer used airbending to fly without a glider. Look here, sugar queen! Zaheer wasn't able to fly until he detached himself from the world. 
Aang never even comes close to detaching himself until the end of Book 2. Besides, this is an adaptation of The Last Airbender, not Korra. And I hope to God they never try that. The only settlement in that area is Water Tribe Village in the South Pole Territory. That's where we have to go. Where you think we'll find the Avatar? Yes. Because of the light? Yes. Every hint, every rumor, every whisper. You think I'm imagining things? The Avatar. And the awesome. It'll all be worth it once I return home in glory to take my place as the rightful heir to the Fire Lord. Rightful heir to the Fire Lord? You mean, restore your honor. Here's an interesting fact that I noticed. Zuko doesn't say the word honor once in the whole episode. Zuko, a character so synonymous with honor, they memed about it in the show. I must find the Avatar to restore my honor. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed. Yeah, yeah, I knew that already. <sighs> oh, that's pretty bad. We just heard a slightly different rendition of this at the beginning, and now you're doing it verbatim? Why? I don't know, guys. Is this really that much better than the 2010 movie? Our mission is vital to the future of the Fire Nation. And so we will find the Avatar. We will prove ourselves worthy and we will see our homes and families again. Or we will die trying. Zuko's speech here is uh, okay. It doesn't really have the same ring that- The safety of the crew doesn't matter. Has, now does it. Aang and Katara then pretend to know each other and talk about how sad their lives are. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Could you be a little less sincere? I wonder what the direction for this was. Um, stutter a little bit when you say I'm sorry and don't try. Blah blah, spiritual mumbo jumbo, blah blah. Tell me, which of these two scenes characterizes Aang and Katara's relationship better? When I was little, I didn't really understand the war. Until the night the Five Vendors came. I need to ask you something. They destroyed everything in their past. What? Please. Everything. Come closer. What is it? Everyone. Will you go penguin sledding with me? Uh, sure. Both, actually. Because their new scenes together would be the same if Aang was asleep. Our beloved and happy air boy is nothing more than a sounding board for more exposition. Remember how the old show established a fun and interesting dynamic between Aang and Katara before getting heavy with their backstories? While setting up their journey to the North Pole? What about the North Pole? It's on the other side of the world. But you forget, I have a flying bison. Appa and I can personally fly you to the North Pole. Katara, we're gonna find you a master. Ah, the good old days. Where's the Penguin! sledding? Come on! You know, people don't just love Avatar for its mature themes and incredible character writing. They love it because it's fun. It reminds us of childhood. Good. Your skills have never been sharper. No, power in fire bending comes from the breath, not the muscles. The breath becomes energy in the body. The energy extends past your limbs and becomes fire. Well, you certainly prepared enough. Now, how about a nice cup of jasmine tea? I don't need any calming tea. I need to capture the avatar. You're a waterbender. I'm a warrior. I should be able to do more for our people. The monks told me bending is about energy and balance. Energy and balance? You mean feeling the bush and pull. Also, how would you know, Airboy? You're an airbender. I'm not a waterbender. Along with not getting the scene about firebending from coming the from the breath, breath, they egregiously dismantle the very nature of bending. The way it worked before was the individual manipulating their chi pathways with mental discipline and martial arts. The element they could bend was determined by which chi pathway they were naturally born with, and by using proper technique. Even though they absolutely destroyed this in The Legend of Korra, but I can only take so much mental torture. <laughs> A little literary theory for you. What does it actually mean to make a good adaptation? To me, there are two schools of thought when adapting something, faithful and unfaithful. The Lord of the Rings is about as close to perfect as it gets when it comes to a faithful adaptation, with Peter Jackson immediately stating the goal of the project to be We had no interest whatsoever in putting our junk, our baggage into these movies. We, we just thought we, we should take what Tolkien cared about clearly. 
we should take those and we should put them into the film. And with the help of hundreds of highly talented people, he created one of the most beloved and iconic trilogies ever made. Even though Tolkien's son absolutely hated it. Nonetheless, it is still viewed by many to be one of the best faithful adaptations. The Fox and the Hound is an example of unfaithful adaptation, because the original book was fucking dark. Seriously, it's not the wholesome story of loss, peril, and friendship against all odds that the movie is. Basically, everyone dies, and that's it. But to be honest, it did serve an interesting purpose, being a commentary for the state of the world at a time when people frankly needed a reality check. They're not people, they're hippies! Ugh, maybe now is a good time to faithfully adapt it. However, good Disney's Fox and the Hound is an example of tastefully making changes to the source material while still producing an enjoyable movie. Both types of adaptation can be executed correctly if led by competent writers and directors. Anyway, back to The Lost Airbender. This is important in a minute. Remember that just now, she's only able to bend this much water. That's kind of small. If this is the path you've chosen, then so be it. Let's sell this between us. I thought you firebenders had some guts. Yeah! Burn the whole place to the ground. So Zuko captures Aang and puts him in prison. But then Sokka and Katara have a bit of a squabble before bravely deciding to fly on Appa to rescue Aang. But... Wait, wait, how, the, how do you know how to fly Appa? We never even saw Aang talking about Appa with them other than when they first saw him. And the only time they've seen Appa flying was when Aang used his whistle, and they definitely don't have that. Where did Appa even go after this scene? If Appa was just gonna fly over anyway, why didn't they have Aang and Appa wake up right after they broke the iceberg? Then we could have shown Aang saying yip yip in Sokka and Katara's presence. Like in the original, setting up them knowing how to fly him. What was it that kid said? Yeehaw, hup hup, wahoo, uh, yip yip. That's correct! Would Appa really let two strangers mount him, let alone fly him? No. <sighs> Albert, did you think no one would notice this because you cut away really fast? Oh, this cost 120 million dollars. Aang's escape is lame. No confidently asking, You haven't seen my staff around, have you? Thanks anyway! I mean, really? No one thought to watch the Avatar in case he might, you know, escape? Nobody? Hold your hair, Loopies girl, you don't get that good until the end of this book. So, let me get this straight. Katara, who we just saw, barely able to make water float in a ball for the first time, can now waterbend from Appa while flying a hundred feet away from any water. Really? It fell higher than that. And block an incoming fireball from an experienced bender. You haven't even gotten the waterbending scroll yet. F*** me. This is bullsh**, and I ain't buying it. Unless the writers wanted Katara to save the gang here instead of Aang because she's a, a warrior, warrior, guys. Women can do things too. We aren't like those bigots who made the original show. We aren't sexist. And it really isn't shot well at all, so you can't really see what happens. No, damn it! So then they skip off to the Southern Air Temple, and oh man, the way this is edited makes it look like the journey from the South Pole to the Southern Air Temple is less than a day. Is everything right next to everything else in this show? First the Fire Nation just walking to the Southern Air Temple, and now this? It's a wonder the Fire Nation hasn't taken over the world by now, with just how close everything is. Remember when it used to take days for the gang to get anywhere? Walking stinks! So they needed to camp and spend more time together, making for interesting side stories and juicy character interactions? He's right! But look at all the pretty CGI! Ooh! Ah! You can't just teleport with the power of editing like me. Plus, you could establish Sokka's love for sleep now, temple later. But nope, this plot's going through story beats faster than Iroh finishing his roast duck. Oh, they took that out too. Okay, we're at the Southern Air Temple. I don't really have much to say about it because frankly, not much happens here. It's just kind of boring and depressing like the rest of the episode. No avatar statue room, no air ball, 
so Aang and Sokka don't get to bond more. Aang 7, Sokka 0. The Gyatso flashback is bittersweet. So strong, and kind, and generous. And the Avatar estate looks pretty cool and powerful, but Aang just kind of gets over it. So we don't get that incredible Katara moment of her telling him that her and Sokka are his new family. How hard it is to lose the people you love! I went through the same thing when I lost my mom! Monk Gyatso and the other airbenders may be gone, but you still have a family! Sokka and I, we're your family now! So, eh. I like how it shows Aang taking Gyatso's necklace to create continuity for way, way later in the finale. I need to follow through on what they wanted me to do. Complete my training and master all the other bending skills so I can bring balance back to the world. Oh, is that all? How we do anything to get it back. The parallel between Aang and Zuko at the end is nice, and any parallel between them is always good. But the one thing I do know is... I'm the Avatar. You gotta deal with it! And this is just the beginning. Wait, someone's missing from your group. Someone very important. Where's Momo? I mean, for real, where is Momo? I get he isn't the most integral character, but you're going for fan service, right? The gang meeting Momo was a phenomenal way to let Aang naturally find Gyatskull, and he's certainly an important enough character for an episode 1 introduction, right? Yeah! Well, f*** you! Buy Netflix! Well, that's it. Pretty much all the charm is gone, and the bar is set so low with the 2010 movie that anything is going to please most. And if that doesn't convince you we live in an era of mediocrity, Aang's new depressing attitude will. And Katara's. Jesus. I don't think it's the actor's fault. They all come across as pretty charming and likable. Who is the most like their character? It's definitely... <laughs> <laughs> Ian's very close, too. Yeah, Ian, like, I got to live with Ian while we were shooting, and bro kept me so positive and happy during like <laughs> some of my like most stressful moments. And I think that's a nod to like oh, actually Sokka looking after Aang and uh, Katara. And they all seem to even have reverence for the show. How do you approach the responsibility of, of portraying these characters? With reverence. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with respect. I mean, we're all fans of the show now. And like, we were all fans before and then Gordon was like a lot born late, yet, but... so like, <laughs> yeah. when he got the role, he like made himself a fan, and he loves the show. Mm -hmm. So I think like it's just awesome to be able to like try to do it. Dallas Leo even talked to Dante Bosco before filming to get a better idea of the character. I remember on our call, um, we talked about the voice. Like, you're obviously your voice in itself is iconic. I get out of here! Yeah, no, seriously, it's it's so. I felt like at the time. And I still feel this way a lot because just seeing what's on the internet, but like, there's a lot to live up to. And I respect the hell out of that. Gordon Cormier looks the part and has good range for how young he is. Kiao and Tio looks enough like Katara, but what happened to my Katara? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not invested in her portrayal at all. But again, she's not to blame for that. Ian Owsley is perfect. He looks like Sokka, he acts like Sokka, and what he's given to work with is Sokka in the same sense that alpha male YouTubers love women. Get it? Because he isn't sexist. It's serviceable at best, and the same as the 2010 movie at worst. Don't let these corpos tell you what to like, just go watch the cartoon. It's not even close just how much better it is in characters, world building, pacing, and everything nice. The music's pretty good, but that's only because they're pulling major aspects from Jeremy Zuckerman's iconic score. And whenever they don't, it's just the most bog standard and forgettable schlop that everything else has. Except maybe Aang's theme. But remember, even if it was a freak accident, we will always have the cartoon, and no one will take that away from us. Oh god, there's seven more!